Mexico, Funk Wells, and Nigeria, and raised nearly $90,000 to educate girls in India. She's a multiple Paul Harris Fellow and benefactor, a world traveler. Dr. Whitlock talked about thrill how thrilled she was to have met the Queen in Nigeria, Jamaica, and Calcutta. At the urging of many supporters, she eventually wrote a book describing the history of Rotary admitting women into its membership. Sylvia's career spanned over 40 years as an educator and then a second career as a family therapist. I asked Sylvia what puts the biggest smile on her face. And of course she said her son's three grandchildren, which grandma zooms every night. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sylvia Whitlock. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening. These days you don't say anything because it could be the middle of the night or the middle of the morning. Okay, so here we are. I'm happy to be here on the edge of tomorrow. This is gonna be a tomorrow when the pandemic's gone. There's a tunnel and we can see the light at the edge of it. And hopefully the pandemic will be gone tomorrow, but also polio will be gone. We have been working on that for a long time, for all the time since we tried to get women in Rotary. You need to know that women in Rotary was the first diversity issue that Rotary dealt with. It was the first issue that said, hey, we don't want gender diversity in Rotary, just men. So we'll tell you a little bit about it. It's been 34, 35, 34 years since the Supreme Court said women had to be admitted to Rotary. And there are many people today who had no idea, who have no idea that there was a time when women couldn't be members, couldn't be members of Rotary. I found out about this when I was a principal in this small school district. Duarte is a small district, about maybe 15 miles east of Pasadena. And you know, Pasadena is where the Rose Parade comes from, or it used to come from so this year, every year. And Duarte is a small district. The biggest businesses in this little community were the City of Hope, a well-known cancer hospital, and the Duarte Unified School District. So when I went to work in the district as a principal, all principals are concerned about how their community is fair because you're working with those kids in school and you want to know what kind of homes they're coming from and what kind of support they have. And so I went into my superintendent and I asked him about the community. And he said, oh, don't worry about the community. We have a Rotary Club here and we'll take care of it. In fact, you're going to be a Rotarian. We're going to invite you to join Rotary. Well, what I knew about Rotary that I had never heard about Rotary before. <laughs> Not an uncommon thing, right? What I knew about Rotary could be loosely written from the head of a pin. I knew about Kiwanis. You know what Kiwanis means? It means waiting to get into Rotary. Well, <laughs> Kiwanian told me that. But you know what, they do the same kind of service. And last week we met with um, Toastmasters because Rotary is considering a partnership with Toastmasters. They do the same kind of service and they're so structured, it's not even funny. Anyway, I knew about Kiwanis, I knew about Elks, I knew about Lions because I was a school person and Lions provide eyeglasses for the kids in the school. But I'd never heard about Rotary. I knew that in my school district, they were not in a struggle with the small Rotary clubs. So I'll tell you a little bit about the legal wrangling and some of the funnier and more interesting experiences I had. So Duarte, bedroom community in the San Gabriel Valley, home to the renowned city of Hope Hospital and the school district. And in that district was a small club struggling as we all do to raise membership. And I want you to remember that that was the issue for membership. The club was trying to enroll members. 
The year was 1976. And the superintendent of schools, who really deserves all the credit for this action, he died many years ago. He looked around at his district and he saw a lot of people, manager types in the 70s, they were all manager types in Rotary. And he saw all these people, principals, reporters, psychologists, and he thought they're perfect for rounding out the Rotary classification system. But they were all women and he didn't know any women in Rotary, but he thought, hey, hey. But he thought, why not invite them? So he went to the district officer and told him what he was thinking. And he asked his advice. And the district officer said, you know, sounds like a good idea to me, Dick, but I tell you what, and I don't want you to think about this because it didn't pass the four-way test. He said, go ahead and invite the women. But when you enroll them in international, don't use their whole names. Just use S. Whitlock, be Stephen Whitlock. M. Elliot could be Michael Elliot. And just don't use their full first names, just initials. And we'll send it through. So, you know, Dick said, hey, sounds like a plan to me. And he invited the women that was in, and he enrolled them. And the women got busy doing what Rotarians do. But one member of the Duarte Club was so against it, he resigned. He said he could foresee the death of the club. And you know what? He was peculiarly situated to recognize death. And when he resigned, we had to replace the undertaker classification. It was <laughs> So, you know, we came in, we did the work of Rotary, we worked with kids, we had yard sales, we had snow cones for the city picnic, we had breakfast with the Easter Bunny, Easter's coming up pretty soon. We had Christmas with Santa Claus, we made Thanksgiving baskets for cancer survivors and for needy families, and we did everything and got busy planning the 25th anniversary of the club. Well, you know when you have those milestone anniversaries, the Rotary sends representatives. So they planned the party. And of course, Rotary sent representatives to party for the party. And of course, they were there. And then at some point, Dick said, well, let me introduce all the Rotarians here. <laughs> and among the Rotarians were these women. And the district representatives, the Rotary representatives said, we don't have women in Rotary. And somebody said, oh, this club has women in Rotary. Well, the consternation was palpable. And so they stayed for the party, but they went back to Evanston and they reported that this little renegade club had women members. Well, International didn't lose any time to write to us and tell us three things. There were no women allowed in Rotary. Number two, the women need to be asked to leave. Number three, if the women do not leave, you need to stop calling yourself a Rotary Club. Simple as that. Well, the club took a vote and decided it wouldn't ask the women to leave. Instead, it asked to appeal to the board of directors. But it was told it couldn't address the board if it were not a Rotary Club. And if the women were there, then it was not a Rotary Club. Well, the club decided it would appeal to the Council of Legislation, which was meeting that year in Tokyo. But it was interesting. Because when the issue came up for consideration, it wasn't whether women should be permitted to be members of Rotary, but it was whether the Duarte Club had violated the bylaws of Rotary by inviting women. And, you know, of course they had. The vote was 1,000 to 34. Imagine, 34 people who thought there should be women Rotarians. Well, the answer, it was clear that I was cast. Uh, there were 34 people, and I met one of them when the convention was in Calgary. 
I was on a train riding into the convention center and I was sitting across from a gentleman and his wife and they were all tagged as I was, the rotary tags. And the gentleman said to me, Duarte, isn't that from the club that invited women to Rotary? Of course, this is years later, you know, and you're in Rotary. And I said, yes, yeah, here I am. And he said, you know, I was at the convention in Tokyo and I voted to have women in Rotary because I always thought they should be there. And his wife who was sitting quietly next to him said, I didn't think so then and I don't think so now. And I thought, why? And she said, you know what? Because we have men going out to rotary meetings at night and we don't want them meeting with women and who knows what. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it's not a social club, it's a service club. We're doing community well. She didn't want to hear about it, she didn't care. So, of course, that's not the first time that the council and legislation had heard the issue on rotary, women in rotary. In fact, in the late, Six days. There had been a, a club from India had taken to the COL in Detroit an item to change the bylaw about women. It was defeated and the club didn't press it. But even more interesting, the first Rotary Constitution did not specify that Rotarians had to be men, just persons of good character. Well, that was a time when there were few women in the workaday world. And because the men were the ones engaging in business and those kinds of activities, the bylaws just evolved into men of good character. So if I could ask Paul Harris a question today, it would be, would you have intentionally excluded women from Rotary? You know, I went to the Paul Harris exhibit in Evanston and there's a larger than life size replica of Paul Harris in the room. And I said, Paul, and I asked him this question. He didn't say a word. He didn't answer. So anyhow, Jack Davis, who was president of Rotary International at the time, said the unity of Rotary International was jeopardized by the unilateral move of the morning club. I think he was so wrong. However, their charter, was recalled. The Rotary International sent a group to Dwardy and asked for the charter of the club. And we had to turn in our charter. And we thought, well, you know, we'll continue doing community service. And then we were really into doing things for the community. And we thought, well, we'll just continue to do community service. And Bill Brooks, who was one of our members said, that's okay, we won't call ourselves Rotary, we'll just call ourselves X-Rotary. So you look at the pin. That's X, it's a Rotary pin with an X on it. We became the X-Rotary Club of Guardian. And I want you to remember, we remained the X-Rotary Club of Duarte for 11 years, 11 years, because an attorney from a neighboring Rotary Club from the Arcadia Club, Sanford Smith said, you know, I think we can take this business to the courts. And so we gave notice to Rotary that we would take it to an old court, California court. And Rotary said, you can't take it to California court. All members of the board of directors are not California. You need to take it to federal court. But the reason they wanted it in federal court was that in New York State, they had had an issue about exclusionary rules for private clubs, private club membership. And it was court and the ruling was favorable. And so Rotary wanted to piggyback on that precedent, but the federal court said, no, you need to hear it in California. So it was first heard in a California Superior Court. And that court upheld the road of his right to expel the club. And so we were in shock because we thought this was a slam dunk. Hey, you know, what is the motto in Rotary? Service above self. We're trying to get women to do service. 
Where is the self part of it? It thinks women should not be members. People were ignoring that bit. They were ignoring the service taking precedent and choosing the self that said, no, we don't want women in the world. So, you know, Sanford thought, okay, we're going to appeal this. We're not going to take this. We'll do, but we'll, we'll have to look for some good grounds for appeal. And there were, because in California, as in many places, maybe where you live also, there are rules that ban discrimination in public accommodation. And Rotary was deemed to be a public accommodation because of its activities, because of its classification system, and because at that time, probably 80% of the members had their dues paid by their employers. It was a public, it was a public system. And so the, uh, the act was the UNRU Act in California that banned discrimination. And so Sanford appealed to the California Appellate Court using the UNRU Act as his argument. And the Appellate Court reversed the action of the California, California Supreme Court. Well, we were very happy. We were very happy with that. But remember, this is just the California action. Well, Rotary immediately tried to appeal to the California Supreme Court, but that court refused to hear the case. And so here we are now with a ruling in California from the appellate court that says women can be Rotarians, but only in California. So that's the year that I was coming in as a president. And it was really interesting because before women came into Rotary, things changed really slowly, okay? So you know what happens when you're a president, you get invited to pets. You get a little postcard that tells you where a pet is going to be and when it's going to be and so on and so forth. And I got the postcard, except I got part of the old stock. And the postcard said, Rotary will be in Garden Grove on March 5th to March 7th um, and please, make sure you bring your coat and tie because direct your pictures will be taken. Well, heck, you know, I don't wear a coat and tie, but you know, I'll go along with the rest of the guys and take my coat and tie. So I did, I went to Pets and I was born woman, 290 men. Can you believe that? 290 men, well, the nicest thing about that proportion was that, you know, when we had restroom breaks during the sessions, guess what? Hey, there's nobody going in the women's restroom. And I'm the only one. And, you know, heck, this was 35 years ago. I could just sashay past the men into the women's restroom because that's where the lines were. Well, they, the men, you know, 290 men, were wonderful. They were polite, they were cordial, they were respectful, and they were curious about what they were hearing. At the section on Rotary International, you know, there's a section where they tell you international, I heard the incoming governor discuss the case. And he said, Rotary International will appeal this to the United States Supreme Court, and we have every reason to believe you. I couldn't believe I was hearing. I was a school principal, and I thought, Supreme Court. That's where they hear, hear Roe versus Wade. That's where they hear Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. That's not what they hear about women in service clubs. And in reference to the small size of our club, he said, it's just the case of the mouse that roared. There's our little mouse. We have a mouse pin and had a, a little rotary icon on his back. So I took furious notes in there and I went back to Dwardy and we made a new banner. It was the ex Rotary Club of Dwardy, the mouse that roared. And we used that banner for 11 years. Well, I didn't think that the Supreme Court would hear our case because I wasn't very sharp about civil rights issues. But this was a big civil rights issue and the Supreme Court did take the case. Uh, 
because one of the attorneys said, you know what? They're just forcing us to take everyone like a motel. Uh, yeah. All right, the argument was that the ruling violated their First Amendment right to do something. But on May the 4th, 1987, four months after they took the case, the court found that considering the size, purpose, selectivity, and exclusivity of Rotary's membership, the relationship among the members was not of the intimate or private variety, which warrants First Amendment protection. So Justice Powell wrote for the unanimous court. Uh, was seven nothing. Sandra Day O'Connor didn't vote because her husband was a Rotarian. You know, she had to go home that night, Clark. But Justice Powell argued that many of Rotary's activities, including their meetings, are conducted in the presence of strangers. And because women members would not prevent the club from carrying out its purposes, there was no violation of associational law. Furthermore, he said, and this was the big paragraph, even if there were a slight encroachment on the rights of Rotarians to associate, that minimal infringement would be justified since it serves the state's compelling interest in ending sexual discrimination, gender discrimination. And there it was. And the decision was now incumbent at all USA clubs. And two years later, in 1989, it was the Council on Legislation made that women could be members of women. I was jabbing to my job as a principal. I'll just tell you this a little bit before I close. As principal of the elementary school when the news came over the airways. Now it came over on the East Coast. And remember, we're on the West Coast. So we're, you know, it's three year, three months late, <laughs> three hours later. So by the time I arrived at school, some 20 minutes later, all the media in the world, the you wouldn't believe the television cameras that were out in front of the school. So were all the kids wondering what the heck was going on. Well, Superintendent Key said, Warren Old May, who was a CBS newscaster, is going to be interviewing for the networks. And you need to come to the district office. You need to take this away from school because we need to have it. And so Mary Lou Elliott and I went up to the district office where we were questioned for hours by Warren Olney. I was asked many questions and they were aimed at me because I was the incoming president and the person with the status in Rotary. So he asked me a lot of questions to which I thought I gave studied and intelligent answers. Well, near the end of the interview, in fact, we were already on our feet. I was asked how I got selected to be president. Now, that's a question you never ask a Rotarian. Because in a decidedly careless and unstudied moment, I said, I can't believe you said it. I said, oh, I don't know. I must have missed the meeting. You know, that's the stock Rotarian response. Well, that evening, the story was on the top of the news, the first item on the news. I was amazed at how much press it got, but it was at the top of the news, including my inane and embarrassing response. Oh, I don't know. I must have missed the meeting. And then, you know, the world's out there saying for 11 years, we waited to hear this. Well, I started to learn then of the capriciousness of the media, and I knew I was going to have to adopt a more serious mode. And of course, back at the club, we had to move our meeting place because we couldn't accommodate the press and the visitors who were ever so curious. I learned how to be circumscribed in any and all answers that I would give about this case. And this was also my year as incoming president. And I had to settle into the goals we had set, which then included polio plus while the whole world was watching. We had some interesting telephone calls including one that asked if the food were any better, no, not there were women. And I explained that we weren't cooking it. We were just eating it like any beef. Some were decidedly less pleasant. Some wanted to know what we were doing about DEI in Rotary. Did we have any black people in Rotary? And I said, now that we have women, why don't you have black people? And I said, well, we did it all in one shot. We have black women. Well, we didn't get a welcome back from Rotary International. But we did get a new due schedule. And of course, 
as I mentioned in 1989, Frank Devlin made a, a, a really uh, impassioned speech in the council of legislation, and they voted to accept women members of the road. But remember, this was an issue. This was 1987, the Supreme Court issue. And it was not until 2004 that the Rotarian printed some articles about women in voting. The first time they acknowledged women in voting. And, you know, and then I was in the centerfold and I was wearing a black turtleneck. I was told when the photographer was coming, wear a black turtleneck. So I did. Okay. Uh, Rotary has removed finally the last vestiges of sexist language. And now they profit most who serve the best. But even more new, and this is really up for, it's an issue now. Even more new, a club may not be chartered unless its membership is open to both men and women. The operative world is open because there are still clubs that do not have women members. This didn't start as a woman's issue. The simple attempt to recruit more members into Rotary. And how successful has that been? Can men and women work together in Rotary? They have for 35 years. Okay, in the US, that's probably about a little over 30% of the members are women. In the world, it's less than 30% of the members who are women. So that was the beginning of my journey through this humanitarian organization that's Rotary. The realization of the opportunity to serve in an ever-shrinking world and the opportunity to meet men and women who can see and articulate a need and its solution, no matter how difficult the way or how meager the resources. R.I. President Majayagbi said, women serve alongside men in every segment of life education, in medicine, in warehouses, and in construction. Why not in Rotary? So I was in an incredibly fortunate place. Rotary has been my life. I have served in many positions, including district governor. And, you know, and I've talked to countless clubs here and overseas. And you've heard some of the things. So Rotary is what adds the purpose to my life. Rotary adds purpose to your lives, and I'm glad to see all of you serving. Thank you. Dr. Whitlock, Sylvia, thank yes. you so much oh, yeah. for joining us tonight. We really, truly appreciate all of the way you and the Club of Duarte, or the ex-Rotary Club of Duarte, have carved the way for women in Rotary so that look at all of, the, of us today are here because you started so many years ago. Thank you so much. Where are your Rotary pins, okay? Their ID pins. Yes. And people see them, don't know what they are, but you can tell them what they are or give them one of those little folders what is Rotary, you know, or write an elevator speech, you know, you can go home tonight, take off your pin and put it on your pajamas while you write the elevator speech. And when that spouse <laughs> says, why are you putting the pin on your pajamas? Explain to them how important Rotary is. So you know what, tomorrow morning when they go to work, they're standing around the coffee machine or the water cooler and they're telling somebody about you and your Rotary pin. And they're just wearing a Rotary pin and they say, Rotary, what's Rotary? Whoops, open and tell somebody else about Rotary and that's how you pass them. Amazing. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. Mm. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be taking questions at the close of the evening for all the speakers because I know, I know everybody has so many questions to ask Dr. Whitlock. But the chat is also available if you have anything that you'd like to share with everyone uh, during that time. And don't forget, we will be putting up the trivia questions for uh, in between our speakers for the for the next little bit. And I would like to hand things over to Johanna. Thank you. So I saw a rotary, uh, not a rotary, my apologies. I, I just saw that the poll actually just came through. 
Uh, so if you want to click on that, we can share the answers in a little bit. So um, we, we would appreciate that. Why don't we move on to our next speaker? Our next speaker is supposed to be Nadine Pemberton. Unfortunately, Nadine um, has been caught in a plumbing mishap um, in St. Lucia. Uh, so she won't be joining us this evening, unfortunately. But following Nadine, we did have Sherry Colburn. Uh, so I'm pleased to announce um, and to present to you Sherry, who is not a Rotarian yet, uh, but I suspect that she will be fairly soon. <laughs> she is a Canadian entrepreneur here, located here in the Durham region and has experience in the Ontario's high-tech sector. Her career has taken her to the far corners of the world in pursuit of building strategic business relationships for the companies she has served. And as CEO, Sherry has guided and, and uh, directed the growth of the Spark Center a group of companies, which includes Synergy Lab and advocates for an international approach to the development of Durham Reason's entrepreneurial ecosystem. She's a strong believer that entrepreneurism brings diverse cultures and people together and that the opportunity for Durham Region lies in its roots as an innovative and diverse region. She is not only a tech entrepreneur, entrepreneur here in Durham, but has also started two other companies, one of them located here in Southern Ontario and the other in the Middle East. So please welcome Sherry Colburn. Thank you all. Uh, you know, I am so inspired by your story, Sylvia. I'm, you know, it, it's, uh, I, don't, I can't follow in those shoes. <laughs> That's an incredible, incredible story. Um, my story is a little different, um, but maybe not as different really, uh, because it sounds to me that as a woman, you were kind of uh, somehow uh, groomed for challenge uh, to take on what you did. And I always say that um, I was, I think I was groomed for challenge since the day I was born. Um, I was an only daughter in a small family of um, older brother, younger brother, but my family are East Coasters. And um, so we had, you know, lots of, lots of siblings. My mom comes from a big family. My dad came from a small family, but lots of kids and every single one of them was male. So uh, I started my challenge, uh, my challenges I think from the day I started to breathe. Um, I was always uh, hanging out with the boys. There was absolutely, we were treated no differently. Not ever, ever, ever. It was just me and the guys. And I feel that it kind of, um, um, certainly positioned me for the career that I was about to take on, although certainly when I was a child, I didn't know anything about that. Um, I had, uh, you know, not having sisters, uh, obviously I did have girlfriends, um, but my most formative years and most formative hours were spent with you know, anywhere between 15 to two boys at any given time. So I kind of learned to hold my own pretty quickly um, because I didn't uh, obviously want to miss out on all the fun that seemed to be going on. Uh, so, you know, my, my childhood was mini bikes, fishing, uh, target practice, bow and arrows, you know, worms in the ravine, frogs, snakes, all that stuff that I wouldn't even touch now. But, uh, you know, when you don't know any different, uh, you just, you, you go along. So I was uh, definitely one of the boys uh, growing up. I often jokingly say to people that I didn't really figure out that I was a woman until I was 31 and I'd finished having my second child. So it, it took me a while. I, I was a quite a hard, hardened uh, tomboy. Um, the, the other thing that I think, um, I guess I would tell you about my story is that um, I've always felt, and I think my mother taught me this, that, you know, life is about expectation. Uh, and so what you expect, you get. Um, now, it's obviously not that simple because <laughs> uh, sometimes we expect things, we just don't get it. But, you know, that's where in uh, lies the challenge, right? And so how do you cope with that? So I cope with it. I think my, my DNA being so influenced by the boys, um, I cope with it by bringing curiosity. So when I'm uh, feeling like I'm being, uh, 
you know, kept out or sidetracked, you know, I come at it from a, a repositioning of challenge into curiosity. Um, I know my brothers, my father, my mother, anybody who knows me well will tell you I ask far too many questions. Um, but that's a way to get people in, in many uh, respects, it's a way to get people disarmed. Uh, because when you're asking questions, you're not, um, you know, you're, you're not really jamming your opinion into them, you're taking them on a journey with you of exploration. And I find that's probably the most powerful way to bring about change is to invite people with you on that journey of, uh, of exploration. And so I think the success that I've, you know, um, enjoyed in my career really came about because at a very early age, I learned that in order, <laughs> in order to go up against the men, I had to, uh, I had to figure out a different approach. And my, uh, my most formidable, um, uh, well, he was definitely my advocate, my dad, but he also was the guy that taught me how to, uh, to, you know, to, to go down this path of exploration. <laughs> so, um, you know, so many times, uh, whether it was something as simple as what time I was allowed to stay out to, or, you know, where I was allowed to go, you know, everything became a debate. And at some point, my father used to just kind of look at me and kind of chuckle and, you know, look at my mom and say, oh, you got to watch out for this one. She's way too smart. And, and that would, that was kind of the history of my life. Just always, um, I guess, advocating for myself is really what that, you know, that boiled down to. The interesting thing about growing up with boys is that I never developed any expectation that I would be treated differently. And so again, you know, when I, you know, got through high school into university, um, I didn't finish university. I, I got two years into university, decided I absolutely hated it. Um, I think the entrepreneur in me just was uh, not, not conducive to sitting and, and um, not being able to engage more fully. Um, but interestingly enough, although I didn't finish my undergraduate degree, I have been on a constant journey of learning ever since. Um, I value learning um, almost more than anything else. Um, I, I, that is one of the reasons why I was so um, quick to say yes when my husband suggested that we go live in the Middle East for four years um, because learning is, learning is what keeps us relevant. Uh, learning is what keeps our mind open. Uh, learning uh, and curiosity to me go hand in hand and, and um, being such an incredibly curious person, it, you know, that's really what I think I, I bring to my everyday. And so because um, I didn't have any expectation of being treated differently. Whenever I walked into a situation, even in a young, as a young woman in my career, I definitely had an expectation that I would be treated equally, um, 100%, like no compromise on that one. And, um, and, you know, my, I often think back about, you know, growing up is that, you know, I wasn't like my brothers didn't treat me like I was a girl like that. I mean, I literally, if you could have seen the way that we used to hack around with each other, <laughs> it was, uh, it was, you know, it was probably ugly by today's standards. Cause you know, when, when uh, things got uh, decidedly, uh, you know, acrimonious, the fists were going and, and mine just as much as the boys. Right. So we, we had this kind of uh, uh, loving, but rough and tumble upbringing and uh, eventually, um, well, you know, you get older, you stop all that silliness because that, that doesn't work. But um, that was when I taught myself the, you know, the power of, of curiosity, the power of, of language and of engaging with people and, you know, taking them along on that exploration with me so I could essentially get them to see things the way I saw. Um, what else did I want? to say about my life. I've just got a few notes here. Of course, my tablet has decided to go off. That's great. It always does that when you, this is technology. Um, 
I made a few notes because I didn't want to forget things that I should share with you. Um, I don't know how many, maybe you can show me with a, 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 like just a show of hands. Have any of you listened to or read um, Matthew McConaughey's book called Green Lights? Anybody? Ah, I see Bev has. It's an incredible book. Um, he talks about his uh, upbringing, his whole story really. And green lights for him are those situations where, you know, life can take a very decidedly nasty turn. And it's through an inherent ability to, um, to take that lesson and turn it into something that is actually a green light, something that makes your life better. And I really didn't, I didn't characterize that, uh, that ability in the way that Matthew McConaughey has in his book until I listened to it. And I remember saying to my husband, you know, um, no disrespect to Matthew McConaughey, but I'm, you know, I was never a great fan of his, uh, but I had seen a review on this book and it really intrigued me. So I decided to buy it, started reading it. Anyway, you know, when I look back at my life, I had so many, uh, what I would call green light moments and green lights can be both positive and they can also be uh, incredibly uh, devastating. They can be, and, and in fact, I would say that the green, the, the best or the most impactful green lights in my life have always been uh, quite negative, you know, the things that the old saying comes to mind that, you know, you learn more from, um, from being, you know, challenged, uh, or, you know, not being able to achieve what you want than you do from success. And I think that's very true. And so my life, you know, I, I went into corporate Canada, um, after I, you know, dropped out of university, uh, interesting story. I was working in Toronto, which is where I was born and raised and um, was working for this paper cutting company, uh, the kind of company where, you, you know, they get these massive cores of rolled paper and then they cut it all down into different types of products. And uh, I decided that it was time for me to get out of Toronto. I was kind of sick of it. And um, so I went to the CEO of the company uh, and you, you can imagine I was a young woman. I was probably only 24 years old. Uh, and I told him that, um, that I was going to leave the company that I had decided I wanted to leave Toronto. I wanted to go out to the you know, west side of the world, out to Waterloo region and, um, and make my way there. And uh, he said, you know, I, uh, I have a friend who runs a company out there and I'm going to give him a call and see if he can offer you a job. And, you know, that was kind of how I got my first job in the tech sector. It was a, a, a job working as a contract administrator uh, for a company called um, Lee Instruments, used to be the old Marsland Engineering building that they were located in. And, um, and that began a career of tech. Uh, I had no technical background. It's certainly not an engineer. Um, my real forte is, you know, business and um, strategic relationships is, you know, really where my, my actual corporate career took me. And, um, you know, I went from Lee Instruments, they eventually pulled out and went back to Ottawa and I, I moved over into a company called Comdev and Comdev was a really, really cool company. Uh, made uh, satellite components for, uh, sort of, I should say, communication components for satellites in the aerospace industry. I got so many incredible experiences, you know, working with NASA, secured, you know, my security level was very high, traveled all over the world, Germany, Italy, California, uh, you know, the East Coast, um, New Jersey. I mean, it, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And I, you know, I have to say, I travel is one of those things that's uh, deeply in my in my blood, I love to get on a plane and I feel very grounded lately because I haven't been able to do that. But um, it wasn't sort of all, you know, kind of, as I like to say to my, my team, uh, it wasn't all uh, butterflies and unicorns. So at some point uh, I did decide to have a family and I gave birth to my son. Um, I would say it was both the best and the worst moment of my life. I fell into what was completely unbeknownst to me at that time called postpartum depression. 
I spent two years in literally a dark hole trying to figure out how I was going to get myself back to, you know, the old Sherry. Um, I'm a bit of a fighter. So, you know, I used my work um, and my relationships with my friends and family to kind of keep me buoyant uh, from going down too deep. And eventually, after years of therapy, um, I managed to pull myself out of that, that very black hole and uh, eventually went on and had uh, my second child, my daughter. Um, but it, it taught me something so profound because um, living, I mean, I'm an inherently happy person. And I remember saying to my mom at one point, the problem with being depressed is that um, I wake up every day, I have no hope. I have absolutely no hope. It's just literally, it feels black from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed and you're very stressed and you're, you know, clinging to things to try to keep yourself up. But it taught me once I got through that, that nothing would ever take me out again. Like it, it was the worst of the worst that I could have ever, ever experienced. And once I made it to the other side, I had this inherent confidence that now nothing could take me out again. Now, I don't necessarily believe that because I think there's all kinds of things that can, can put you into that uh, state of mind. Uh, and I've been you know, watching uh, very closely uh, my family and my own friends and, and um, my, my employees because COVID has had that kind of devastating effect on people. And I, you know, I, I think it's, it behooves all of us to you know, keep in a close, eye on all our friends and family during this time because it, it is quite uh, it's been quite difficult for people but you know the 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 green light for me uh after that experience was knowing that you know i had an awful lot of strength within me to keep going and that that has served me very well um at some point i decided that i would leave corporate canada because i was uh, kind of tired of the big corporations and I moved to the very first startup I had ever worked for and again <laughs> you know you can't you can't make these stories up it was the most dysfunctional company I've ever worked for in my life it had a grand total of 11 people in it and you can imagine when you join such a small company if it is horribly horribly dysfunctional which this one was it's a tough go, right? Because every day you're getting up and you're going into a company that you just don't want to go to. But I, you know, I did it and I learned so much. And in fact, uh, I always uh, cite this experience as the thing that really taught me how to be an entrepreneur. Because although I wasn't the entrepreneur in that company, I watched other entrepreneurs try to build a company and because they made so many colossal mistakes, I had a book uh, essentially of how to get there. You know, it was, it was like they did everything wrong. And, you know, now I had a bit of a, a path to, to do things right. And then I guess the, you know, some of these other green light moments for me have been, you know, when I moved to the Middle East. So, um, Again, you know, one day my, of course, our kids are now grown and gone. My husband called me up and he said, hey, what do you think about going to the Middle East? And I'm, I'm thinking for a couple of weeks, right? It's going to be a nice trip over to the Middle East. It's going to be lovely. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. You know, when do you, and he goes, well, you know, maybe you should sit down. I just want to have a little more talk about this Middle East thing. And I'm like, all right. And he said, you know, what do you, what do you think about going there to live? And I'm like, hmm why don't we start with the two weeks and then let's go from there. Cause I have no idea. I've never been to the Middle East. So off we went, uh, his boss and he were very, very clever. And whoever thinks that women manipulate and only women manipulate, let me tell you, this is a gender agnostic behavior. <laughs> and um, they put me up in uh, probably one of the best hotels in Muscat, Oman. And I thought this place was great. It was so beautiful. The people were beautiful. The beaches were beautiful. The, like the, everything about it was beautiful. Um, and then we had to make a decision. So I said, you know what? You know, I, I don't know if I could do this forever. Um, but we made the commitment to his boss that we would, we would give it a go for anywhere between 12 months and 18 months. 
Well, I don't think I had the, the word yes out of my mouth. And uh, the very next day, you know, the weight of that decision sort of sits in on you. And uh, I was like a basket case. I remember my husband and I going out for dinner and all I could do was sob and, and cry. And he kept saying to me, well, let's talk about it. And of course, I'm, I mean, I'm growing up with boys, right? I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. I just want to suck it up and get on with it. Like I've made my commitment. I have to do this. So let's not talk about it. Because every time you ask me to talk about it, I start crying all over again. But I, uh, we, we mustered through. And the, the very next day, uh, we had a, a gentleman take me off. The, the guys were going off to do some business stuff. And I thought, well, you know, I'll just go up to the mall and kind of look around. And I kid you not. I'm walking through a 100% authentically Arabic shopping mall and I see a Tim Hortons. I took a picture of the Tim Hortons. I sent it to my husband. I said, it's all good. I can do it. <laughs> so it was just this kind of reminder of home, right? Canada is still with me. Uh, you know, sometimes you go to the U.S., you can't find a Tim Hortons, let alone going to, you know, Muscat Oman. But, you know, it, it began um, an adventure for me um, that has shaped my life immensely. I've always been very global. Uh, I call myself a global citizen. Uh, I think that's why Rotary is very appealing to me. And uh, Frank Audino, who's on this call somewhere in the very many squares here, uh, has invited me to um, Whitby uh, Sunrise uh, Club so many times. Uh, the people there are just outstanding. Uh, love them to bits. I uh, love going. And uh, I said to Frank, it has so affected my uh, view of, you know, what a service club can be like that, you know, when I retire and I'm not running three companies, I am going to absolutely join Rotary. I live down here in Prince Edward County and I understand there's all kinds of cool clubs down here. So um, I will absolutely uh, make that a priority. And in the meantime, uh, I will just continue to give my time when I can to, uh, to the various clubs that ask me to, to support them. Um, I guess the other thing, and I realize that I'm conscious of time here, Johanna, so I won't uh, go on for too long. Um, I think one of the things that you know has been really important in my life, perhaps because I was shaped by growing up with the boys, um, is diversity. Diversity is so near and dear to my heart. And you know, since um, taking over uh, at Spark four years ago, um, you know, I I've diversified my board. I have uh, built uh, a company of very strong uh, executive females. Uh, in fact, I was speaking with someone today and they said to me, if I remember correctly, I looked at your website and you have a complete team of executive women. And I'm like, mm -hmm, that's correct, I do. And I always say to people, I didn't do that because um, I have mostly, in, when I was in corporate Canada, high tech, the high tech sector is, a, is very much a bro club. And uh, I grew up managing uh, men all the time. And so... You know, I'm really used to working with men and really used to managing men, directing men. But when I came to uh, Spark and I started interviewing for the kind of impact that I needed and knew I wanted to, to, to make in that organization, um, it was really the women who showed up in my world with this passion uh, for joining me on that journey. And so hence why I, I hired so many women. Um, I wanted to sort of leave you with um, one thought tonight, and it came across my, my LinkedIn feed today. Uh, I'm sure many of you know Arlene Dickinson. She's an incredible female investor, Canadian icon on Dragon's Den. She did a really interesting post today, and I just, I'm going to just quickly read it off to you. She says... I'm thinking about the stats I've been sharing about the disproportionately negative impact the pandemic has had on women. Thinking about the women who aren't sleeping, who are juggling childcare, parent care, homes and careers. Thinking about the women who are working extra hours to run their biz while juggling everything else. 
the ones who have lost their jobs, the ones struggling to be recognized at work while they barely recognize themselves from being so exhausted. Thinking about how VC funding, so venture capital funding, which is very important in my world, um, has decreased for women going from an already abysmal 2.8% of all funding to 2.3%. And wondering what it will take to stop talking about it and start fixing it. 50% of our population needs action, not words. We need work flexibility, better childcare solutions, equal pay, advancement of women in corporations, mental health support. We need to deliver more funding and financing. Women have been on our front lines in healthcare, retail, and at home, and have been teaching, feeding, caring for, and supporting others without the same pay, opportunity, or support. We are expected to do far more with far less. If you manage investing, run a corporation, or have authority, then it's in you to change this. And here's the quote that really sunk into my heart today. Women aren't asking for more. We are asking for the same. Thank you. Sherry, thank you so much for sharing your story. It was fascinating to hear you speak. I've known you uh, for, I guess, just a little bit over a year at this point. And in fact, for everyone on the call, Sherry is my CEO. So I am one of her directors. <laughs> my awesome female directors, I might add. <laughs> one, of the, one of the many. <laughs> we have 27 people at the office and I believe there's only two men on the team. Only so two. it truly is female. <laughs> but uh, I don't think I knew all of those stories. So thank you so much for sharing that with, with us to, this evening. I'd like to post another poll up, Mark, if we can. Did you get the first one there? When was Val Wade for District Governor, District 707? <clears throat> An overwhelming response. I think everybody knows Val quite well. They had 60% or the correct answer, which is 2013 <laughs> and 14. I got so it the, right. The next poll will be, um, and I think I mentioned this uh, early on in my uh, two minutes of talking, who was the first woman DG in 707? Did you put that one up? Oh, there we there go. We go. Hmm. Very good. <laughs> have you got back the responses yet? I have, and it's 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 relatively close. I, in fact, it's so close. I might just give it another <laughs> five seconds here. <clears throat> well, anyway. Um, the person who came in second, they, there's obviously a lot of respect for her, and and uh, that's Linda Rainey. Linda hasn't been DG. I, I would love to see her as a DG someday. But Joan Hayward was the first uh, woman DG in 707. <laughs> well, thanks for participating, everyone. That was awesome. <laughs> I'd like to turn it back over to Jan. I know she's going to be introducing our final speaker for the evening. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Valerie Wafer had a 27-year career as Tim Hortons restaurant owner, one of Canada's iconic restaurant brands, where her restaurant operations were widely recognized for their inclusive hiring practices, particularly the employment of people with disabilities. Valerie joined Rotary in 2005. She has served as district governor of 7070 with RI training. 2018 Toronto Convention Host Organization Committee Member, Assistant Regional Rotary Foundation Coordinator, and RI President Representative. She has led a vocational training team focused on youth suicide and depression, audited Rotary Foundation grant projects in Tanzania and Kenya, and volunteered during a 2012 National Immunization Day in India. She is our RI incoming vice president for 2022. I would, it's my honor to introduce my friend, Valerie Wafer. Thank you so much, Jan. And Jan was part of that HOC, that Toronto Convention Committee. And we actually have a WhatsApp group. We made, we had so much fun doing that, that we keep in touch. In fact, we had a Zoom meeting a couple of weeks ago with Betty Joe's on the line too. Um, so anyways, thank you so much for inviting me to be with you tonight. 
what an exciting day. It's International Women's Day. And I started my day in Cairo, Egypt. Jan actually thought I was there, which was kind of funny, a little joke between us. I started off my day in Cairo, Egypt. I spent lunch in California, and now I'm here in District 7070. So, you know, it's been, it's been a really great day and a lot of great conversations happening. You know, empowerment of women and advancing women as leaders isn't a new topic. We've been discussing this for decades. And I'm pleased that we have made significant strides in our quest for gender parity. We heard from Sylvia. Sylvia, your story is so powerful. And it's hard to believe that it's been 32 years since that epic Council on Legislation decision to allow women into Rotary. But we know that it was not the beginning of the conversation. And you alluded to this. There was many people around the world, men and women, and the efforts to bring women into Rotary. What I find really interesting is that one year later, or by 1990, after that decision, two years later, female Rotarians numbered 20,000 because they were waiting in the wings. They were, you know, some of them were breaking the rules like Sylvia, thank goodness for Sylvia. <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and we were joining anyways with again, the support of male Rotarians. Progress never happens quickly, as quickly as we want, but progress is being made. And we can't lose sight of the hard work of those who came before us. And I couldn't think of a more fitting day or opportunity to pause and say thank you. I think we are all so inspired by you, Sylvia. You, you were a trailblazer. You were the mighty mouse that roared. And we just really want to say thank you to you for being with us tonight and for, for being allowing us to be here tonight. So I just I really want to take a moment to really thank you, Sylvia. I also want to thank your Rotary Club of Duarte because you know they, they were fighters and I love that. I also want to say thank you to every single woman on this call for you being here and paving the way. You know that my heart is in 7070. That's where I grew up, <laughs> where I grew up as a Rotarian. So, you know, I, I, I love each one of you and the women in Rotary have just really paved the way in 7070. There's so many advocates and activists who have fought for women's rights over the last four or five decades and they deserve our praise too because we're living in a more just society today. In Rotary, we are ready to embrace change. And this is obvious by us being here today and having this conversation and the number of events that have been planned all throughout this day, um, a chance to celebrate the incredible efforts of advancing women as leaders. Now, when we look around the world today in this time of COVID-19, we recognize that countries who have responded positively with affirmative action to mitigate the health and socioeconomic impacts are those that have female leadership. And yet there are only 20 countries in the world that have a female head of state. You know, we're also aware, uh, unlike the Spark example from Sherry, that females represent less than 20% of executives and board of director positions in corporations. And that it's not just gender equity that's a concern, but also equal pay. But the interesting thing is, and again, Sherry mentioned some of this from Arlene Dickinson's quote, COVID is reminding us that women for the most part work in frontline positions such as nurses and caregivers. And this has brought added strain. And at times like this, add in the strain of working from home while juggling the lion's share of childcare, home schooling your children and, and the housework. There's been a lot of conversation in the last day, certainly on the news today as we uh, are talking about being a year in lockdown, but also the fact that it's International Women's Day. There's been a lot of conversation of how what's happening now in COVID and the added responsibility for women might be might set us back by about a decade. And we're you know we're into a year of working from home, and we are seeing some positive indicators, not a lot, but I like to pick up on the positive <laughs> that. There is somewhat of a shift in some role sharing at home with, with some of the household tasks. And it's not huge by any mean, but one that may help shape perceptions around men, you know, doing things like applying for parental leave and men playing a more active role that was traditionally biased towards women. So that's, that's my little nugget of hope that might come out of COVID. And it gives me the hope that women leaders will look different going forward. In Rotary, we have the power and the opportunity to change. The statistics of women in Rotary leadership over the last five years is heading in the right direction. 
female club presidents in the last five years have moved from 19% to 24%. And although it's still not where it should be, that's a pretty big jump in change. And three years ago, as you probably all know, we didn't have a woman on the Rotary International Board of Directors. Now we have 35% representation. And next year we'll have 47%. And of course, we're celebrating our first female president a nominee Jennifer Jones from Windsor, Ontario, Canada. So exciting, exciting times. There are a few ways that we can see change in Rotary. You know, first we can set policy. And policy is important because it shows intent and it shows leadership. But without with a policy without a culture change doesn't gain acceptance and traction. We need to promote and develop female leaders in our clubs and our districts because it all starts there. Sylvia mentioned some of the Council on Resolutions and um, you know it all began in 2018 when the RI board um, was asked to consider two resolutions brought forward. One was to promote women in Rotary and the second was to increase opportunity for women, young leaders and people of different races, ethnicities to serve in leadership. So these requests were brought because they're resolutions brought to the RI board to consider and it resulted in Rotary International's diversity, equity, and inclusion statement, which I'm sure you've all seen. And I know I've spoken to this district a few times as I actually chair the Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force for Rotary International. But we also know we have work to do. A statement is just a statement without the action. And the journey will never end. So following these Council on Resolutions, when we continue down the policy road, the Council of Legislation in 2019 passed a policy to direct our organization to build a well-balanced membership that celebrates diversity and that no club can limit membership based on gender, race, color, creed, national origin, or sexual orientation. So the journey is continuing, right? And if you were in Hamburg at our international convention a couple of years ago, it was announced that there was a goal to have women in Rotary and leadership positions of 30% by 2023. So will we make it? In North America, we currently sit at 33%. But in Asia, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, they, there's only 19% representation of women. So globally, we're at 24%. So again, I ask, will we make it? It's only two years away, and we have decades of culture and change in certain parts of the world that need to be addressed. But without the goal or the policy, there's no intent and there's no leadership statement. So we know we need to lead by example. But here's the hope, here's the great thing. There's, this isn't an issue with our Rotaract members. Women in Rotaract globally have a 45% representation. And in the US, Canada and the Caribbean, we have the largest female membership in Rotaract at 54%. So we've talked about bringing women into Rotary. Let's talk a little bit about how we empower and advance women in leadership and the benefits to Rotary. So just like any diverse organization, we know the benefits of a diverse, inclusive workplace. Diversity brings innovation, it brings improved decision-making, a larger talent pool, diversity of thought, relations with customers in our community. So, you know, what's, what's really holding us back? And, and so this is the conversation that's happening today. And at the board level, we've had much discussion based on research and findings. And again, we've looked at policy. What are, for example, what are some of the leadership roles and requirements for certain roles like district governor or director? Um, so, for example, we know you have to be in Rotary for seven years before you can become a district governor. Then three years have to elapse before you can be nominated as a director. And you know, when you think about diversity and bringing new and fresh perspectives to the table, that seems to be holding us back. We should be putting a greater weight on personal or professional skills and leadership ability. We also need to look at our selection process, both at the international level, but particularly at the club and district level. So I wanna share a story and you might recognize that it's about bias and microaggression, but I think it's an important story 
Um, and it's recent, which might surprise you. So in the fall, I received an email from a, a female Rotarian who is applying to be district governor. And when her application was received, she was given the invitation to interview. Also included in the invitation was an invitation and expectation that her partner would attend the interview. And she found this really puzzling because her commitment and belief in Rotary has never interested him. And any success or achievement she's had in Rotary has been exclusive of his involvement. Additionally, it was made clear to her that her partner was expected to be at all district training and social events. And when she asked for the reasoning behind this, she was told so that her partner could ask questions about the role his wife was applying for. That was one of the reasons he was being encouraged to go to the interview. So he could ask questions about the role she was gonna apply for. So let's just pause. And I have to say, when I read the email, I had to pause. I probably paused for quite a long pause, scratched my head. How is this the empowerment of women? You know, it clearly isn't. And as I said, this was just in 2020. We speak about making Rotary more inclusive, but then we have bias towards married status or expect expectation that the role is so time consuming, you must have to have support and you have to have a partner by your side at all events. So, you know, this is one example, but it tells us that that patriarchal history of our organization still exists. It still influences some bias and some decision-making. And when we think about it, any woman who has had the leadership to step up and step forward in this role has likely sustained a certain amount of unconscious bias and microaggressive behavior in her past. So, you know, it's funny. I mean, it's not funny, but as this person indicated to me, why would I accept this role in a volunteer capacity? You know, this is something that unfortunately we experienced in the past in our corporate world, maybe still some it is happening. So this is our volunteer capacity, you know, and, and she was really saying to me, is this who we are? And, you know, it made me realize a couple of things. It made me realize that our interview panels certainly need to be diverse. We need to have that representation at the interview table if we're going to support women, if we're going to support younger members and those from underrepresented groups in leadership positions. And I think we also need to take a look at the requirements and the responsibilities so that working professionals can hold these jobs. Um, you know, I know that Dis District Governor Mark, your year maybe didn't evolve the way you wanted, but I also knew that you had plans to do things differently. And I know some of the people before you did as well. So, you know, are we making it mandatory that district governors have to visit every single club and do the same speech? I know, Mark, you're working. And so you were gonna make it fit into the way you could do the role because it was very important. And I think we need to do more of that. And we know that quite often, um, many, many Rotarians don't step forward for leadership roles because they haven't had the opportunity to see Rotary outside their club. You know, they haven't had a chance to serve on committees. Um, they've turned down these opportunities because of commuting and commitments um, at home or work. And I just think this year has given us some opportunities to really revisit a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, diverse leadership in Rotary doesn't cost anything. So just think about that statement and I'll repeat it. Diverse leadership in Rotary doesn't cost anything. Our experiences are equal, but often our opportunities are not. So, you know, now is our time. Now is our time to reach out and engage new leaders, Rotarians and Rotaractors in meaningful positions, mentor, ask Rotarians what they're passionate about and offer them possibilities to grow and learn. We, you know, we are a bottom-up organization. Leaders come from our clubs. They aren't born at the district level. And it's really important that we cultivate the leaders at the club level. You know, I mentioned that Rotaractors already have gender parity fi figured out. Well, making these jobs more doable in the near future, I hope that we see a rotor actor as a district governor. And why not? As I said, they've already got, and it's probably going to be a woman because they've already got gender parity figured out. So, you know, when we looked even to see how Rotarians feel we should be electing our leaders, 
Um, and this is all about, you know, equal opportunity um, for electing not just women in, in Rotary, but younger members. We, we had a recent survey that asked Rotarians if the current path to becoming a leader in Rotary is outdated. I don't think you'll be surprised. 62% of people said the path to leadership in Rotary is outdated. And the same survey in turn asked them, how should we select our leaders? And 73% said selecting our leaders by results and the potential of that person. So, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I'm gonna close just with my, my own little personal Rotary journey. And you guys probably know a lot of this, but you know, I joined the Rotary Club of Whitby, not Whitby Sunrise, but Whitby in 2005. And so, you know, 15 years ago, it'll be 16 years this year. And many may say, well, how did you get to be a director that quickly? And, and honestly, did I have ambitions to become a director when I joined? No, I mean, it never entered my mind. In fact, I don't even think I knew what a director or a zone was. Um, so the next year after I joined Rotary in 2006, I was asked to consider joining the board in my club and be a future president. And again, I was like, no, 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 not interested. Just want to be Rotary. Just trying to get my head around the acronyms, right? Just trying to learn what Rotary is all about. But, you know, by 2008, I was ready and I acted as president of Rotary Club of Whitby in 2008 and 9. And before my year was finished, um, Doug Byers was going to be the district governor the very next year. And he asked me to be assistant governor while I was still president. I was like, hang on, like, I'm not even finished my year. I have so much more to do, but it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Being an assistant governor was one of the best experiences. It got me out of my club and it let me really understand Rotary outside my club. And then of course, according to the poll question, yes, I was district governor in 2013 and 14, you know, and, and so really why am I telling you this journey? And I'm telling you this journey because each time I said yes, there was somebody tapping me on the shoulder saying, I believe in you. And that's our role here today. Everyone here today, recognize leadership in women, promote women and tap a young woman, a woman on the shoulder and say, I believe in you. And that is what we're here to celebrate today. It's what our role is going forward. I'm excited to be part of Rotary when we have gender parity on the board, when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's part of our everyday conversation. And events like this just really help to celebrate our accomplishments and celebrate Sylvia Whitlock, who is allowing us to be here today and have this conversation and know that we are building a Rotary that our daughters will want to be part of and our grandchildren will want to be part of. So thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this very special evening with you. Valerie, thank you so much. Um, got a little emotional there when you're talking. You are such an inspirational and motivational person. And I can't think of another woman that I would like to see be our vice president next year for Rotary International. You're gonna do an amazing job. And I, I just so excited for you and for the rest of Rotary. It's gonna be a great year. Thank you for everything you've done up to this part. And I know that you've got miles ahead of you and I uh, can't wait to be on your coattails with the next thing you ask all of us to do. I'm particularly happy that you mentioned Rotary and Rotaractors. Um, that hits close to my home, actually. My daughter is a Rotaractor at the Laurier University. And during COVID, of course, of course, she's at Laurier University, but she's really just 10 feet from our kitchen table this whole year because she's doing it all online. But I'm proud of the Rotaract Club because they've done a phenomenal job of staying together and being um, in communication with each other and keeping that social uh, energy going to carry them to the next year in um, their university years and Rotaract. So again, I'd just like to thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention. I think it's so important. Um, at this time, I would like to hand things back over to Johanna. Thanks, Dan. 
Uh, I think that concludes all of our speakers for this evening. So I just wanted to special, send out a special thank you to Sylvia, to Sherry, and to Valerie. This was a phenomenal, phenomenal evening. Um, I appreciate you coming forward and um, giving your remarks and, and talking to us all. I've been watching the chat um, with a flurry of activity throughout the evening. So thank you so much, ladies, uh, for coming to speak to us. I'd like to open it up uh, to the floor and ask if anyone has any questions, if you can either raise your hand uh, so I can call on you or if we can just monitor the chat and see if there's anyone there. Is there no questions? Uh, Linda Ryder, yes. It's not so much a question, but I would just like to say before the evening is over today, this evening, um, uh, uh, something about Wilf Wilkinson. The year that Wilf Wilkinson was the international president, we had more women as district governors. And if we look around our district right now, Valerie, myself, we have Jennifer Jones, Dean Roars. We all serve so, at some capacity under Wilf Wilkinson. So thank you, Will, for being a leader of women. Thank you. I see here that Joe Solway also has a question. Thank you for, it's just, it's wonderful to be among uh, so many great women, um, so many strong, accomplished women. Um, and thank you for, uh, for doing this, Johanna, and uh, the rest of the team who put this together. Um, Sylvia, I have a question for you. Um, I, I was poking around and saw that you had, um, you're quite involved in supporting, and, and pr forgive me if I get the name wrong, the Piali School in India. Can you talk a little bit about that and why it's important for you to support that particular school? All right. When I was uh, when I was getting ready to be district governor, I read a book called Half the Sky. Thank you. It's written by Christoph Dick. It was about the Chinese proverb says, "Women hold up half the sky," and that book dealt with the victimization of women in the world, including in these United States. And what the author proposed was that. Education, education for women, for girls, was the best action to counter these activities. And so I looked around to see how I could get involved in that. And in the Santa Barbara area, there was an Indian woman, Deepa Willingham, who was getting ready to start a school for girls in India, in a little town called Piali Junction, maybe about 30 miles away from Calcutta. And uh, she had started the school. She was supported by the Rotary Club of uh, Calcutta Metropolitan. And um, girls in this school, the only thing that village had going for it was a water well that had been built by the Rotarians. Um, there were girls in that school, 10 or 11 years old, who had never seen the inside of a school before. They had little buildings that, with benches and desks on them. And the girls would have their, lunch, their breakfast in the morning, their lunch and their dinner before they went home and they would take classes sitting right next to each other. We couldn't have physical distancing in there. It wasn't, it wasn't possible. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to get involved in that. And so the year that I was district governor, we raised $90,000 and we built a state of the art school in Piali. If you go, all of you go to paceuniversal.com and look it up, you will see that school, state of the art, three-story building with with oh, computer labs. They had to argue with the town fathers to get a dish so they could have computer. They have hot and cold running water, teach the girls how to use bathrooms, flush toilets, and all of that. But they have an education that's next to none. And some of those girls are coming out and getting ready to go to college now. And they're doing wonderful stuff. So if you're looking for something to support, it's the Piale Learning Center in India through the Rotary Club of uh, Calcutta Metropolitan. Great, great project. I go every year and I do workshops with the teachers as I'm an educator. That's what I do. And so I go, I, the last time I was on an airplane was last March when I went to Calcutta to work with those teachers. Very good. John, I see you have your hand up as well. You're on mute. Yeah. There we go. 
put your sound on. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, it's not so much a question uh, as a, a point. Uh, I reiterate what Valerie said uh, in regards to assistant governors. Uh, currently, we have seven women out of 16 assistant governors. And I would strongly encourage all you ladies out there to think about it and go for it. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Absolutely. Ellie, you also have your hand up as well. I do indeed. Um, just on a very selfish note, I want to say thank you to my good friend, Johanna, and to Jan for organizing this. I think it would be an absolute awesome endeavor to do this again next year. Hopefully we can meet in person and maybe expand it outside of even our district. But uh, I think first and foremost, start at the district and blow this right out of the water because women of the world need days, more than one day a year, but we need the time to gather, to put our thoughts together and just honor ourselves. So thank you, Johanna. Thank you, Jan. And here's to next year. Yeah, thank you, Ellie. And I think we have one more. Uh, I saw one more question. Did Dan have his hand up? Is that what I saw? Will had his hand up, I believe. Oh, Wilf had his hand. I I can't I can't see all the different speakers. So there's Wilf and Dan. Okay, we'll take two more. So Wilf, you go first. Oh, I, I thank you very much, Jim Jeremy. I'd just like to uh, congratulate all involved. Uh, I. I was a little concerned at the beginning because they said that uh, Jan Hollison was a member. She didn't know of the Trenton Club, but and uh, uh, of, the, of the Colbert, not the Colbert Club. And uh, pardon? They said Peyton. Well, she's not. She's a member of the Trenton Club. I, I, I sponsored her when she moved to Trenton uh, to last year. So uh, I'm very proud of, 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 of her. And uh, but I'm also proud of all the women that I've been associated with. Uh, I've heard Sylvia speak on several occasions. Uh, I, I think I heard her in in, um, in, uh, in California. I remember the first time I heard her was in California at a district conference there. And the uh, another time was in the Honduras, I believe. And, but she really gets around. And she always does an excellent, an excellent job. Uh, as far as, uh, as the people, the women who have succeeded in, in Canada, uh, I'm very proud of them too. I, I think the Trenton Club was among the early clubs to have women. And we were, when we brought women into the club, we said, no, we're not going to have one club. We're not going to have one. We'll start with at least four. And that's been, uh, that, that started the ball rolling. And, and uh, right now, I didn't say that we're 50 50, but we're, Close. It may be there might be more there may be more women in the club than there are men, but the uh, we're right on the border. So I, I certainly say to all the people that, that I spoke, Jennifer Jones and of course Valerie and uh, Valerie Wafer and uh, sorry, not Jennifer didn't speak, but uh, uh, Sylvia and 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 Sherry and and Valerie, uh, all of their presentations were excellent and. That's what we need. That's what we need in Rotary. Uh, we need particularly to attract more members because uh, that's the big challenge today because of the, uh, the difficulty within, within the community. So keep up the good work. Keep up the good work and good luck to all the women of the district. And hey, you'll bring us men along too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Wilfred. Is there any other questions that we have? I can take one more. Don't see any hands, not unless someone speaks. Okay, what I'd like to do then is make my final remarks. So thank you so much for coming out this evening. 
this was an amazing event to have hosted and to have Jan at my side was absolutely fantastic. She made my life completely seamless. So a big hats off to you, Jan. <laughs> I recall our conversations on the 401 while I'm traveling, usually in my car, back and forth. Uh, so you made my life so much more easy <laughs> doing this. And this has been fantastic. It's been a wonderful experience. And I'm hoping that this marks the first of many um, evenings that we'll have doing this. I'd like to think that we'll be back here next year, uh, either hosting it through the 7070 again, um, or um, I guess in a, in a bigger audience as well. So I think there, there's certainly the opportunity for that. You're more than welcome to reach out to myself or Jan and uh, if you would want to be part of that, um, that effort as well. So thank you so much to all of you for attending. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, everyone. So Mark, did you want to make final remarks as everybody drops off? I think anything I have to say is uh, probably not as valuable as what's already been said. So wonderful celebration of International Women's Day. Three fantastic speakers. Thank you, Anna and, and Jan. And it was my mistake. I was the one who said Picton. Sorry, Wilf, I should have said Trenton. Um, but thank you, everybody. We had 75, 76, or actually 80, 80 some members uh, joining us tonight and the wonderful celebration. So uh, we're back again Tuesday Talks tomorrow, but hopefully we'll have this as an annual event, uh, uh, the International Women's Day and, and in person next year. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Say bye bye. Well done, Jan.